Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that your word is able to minister to us in all of life's challenges and opportunities. We thank you that you're the God who is near us, a God who is compassionate, a God who is understanding, a God who is powerful, and a God who loves us more than we can ever ask or imagine. We pray now, O oh God, that you'll speak to us in a way that only you alone can, meeting the needs of our hearts and guiding us into a future that is with you, a future that is secured in your love. So let the words of my mouth and the reflections of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. An overweight businessman decided it was time for him to shed some pounds. And he decided to observe a Lent of self-denial with the hope that during Lent he can reduce his weight significantly. And so he took his diet very seriously, even changing his route to work in order to avoid his favorite bakery. One morning, however, he showed up at work with a box of meat rolls. Everyone in the office told him off for giving in to temptation. But he continued to smile. This is a special box of meat rolls, he explained. I accidentally drove by the bakery this morning, and there in the showcase window was a host of goodies. I felt it was no accident, so I prayed. Lord, if you want me to have one of those delicious meat rolls, let there be a parking space right in front of the bakery. <laughs> and sure enough, there it was, after circling the block for eight times. <laughs> I'm sure that we can all relate to giving in to this kind of temptation. In fact, temptation of one kind or another forms a part of almost everyday life as we give in and do things that we know are not right and things that we know that we ought not to do. On numerous occasions, we have confessed confidently, I reject the devil and everything that it does. But the truth is, how successful have we been in carrying out what we have promised? It seems that we are bombarded with temptations of every kind coming from all directions every single moment, and we often give in very easily. Today's text tells us that Jesus wasn't exempt from temptations either. When we think about Jesus, it's easy to forget that he was as human as you and I. He ate, he drank, he slept, he got dirty, he prayed, he cried, he gave thanks, he worshipped, just as we do. Jesus did and experienced all the things you and I experience in this life. He even experienced temptation. And Mark tells us in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. This is Mark's very short account of the trial or the testing of our Lord Jesus Christ. But before he began his public ministry on earth, 
But as I have spent time with this passage this past week, as brief as it is, I have found myself being surprised and indeed blessed by how much this brief passage of Jesus' temptation as recorded by Mark offers to us. I believe that what it tells us about our Lord is meant to be a source of great encouragement and a blessing to all of us, the people of God. And so I want for a moment to talk to us about Jesus' temptation according to Mark and what that may be saying to us, helping us overcome our own struggles, testings, and temptations, especially as we begin this Lenten season. And I want us to consider several things. First of all, for us to consider that Jesus knows how it feels to undergo the unexpected appearance of temptations and trials. Again, I take you back to Mark's gospel. And Mark says, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. For us to understand that, we have to go back a bit and ask, what is it that happened before this? What happened before this is John the Baptist baptizing people, a baptism of repentance, pointing the way to Jesus. John makes it clear that he is not the Christ, that there is one who is coming after him, whose sandals he's, uh, he's not worthy to untie. And then while John was speaking about Jesus, Jesus appears on the scene, walks up to John and asks John to baptize him. John protested because this goes against John's theology. It goes against what John expected. John expected that the Christ, the Messiah, would baptize him and not the other way around. But Jesus said to him, let it be so for now. And so John complied, and John baptized Jesus in the River Jordan. Just after John had performed the act of baptism, there was a rumbling in the air. Something was happening. It was a divine moment. The clouds split open. And according to Mark, a dove descended from heaven and rested on the head of Jesus. And as though that was not enough, there was a voice from heaven. And Mark tells us it was not just any voice. It was the voice of God the Father. And God the Father has something to say in this very special and sacred moment. God the Father says, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Last week, we looked at the transfiguration of Jesus, and there were similar words that were spoken from the mountaintop when Peter says, let us build three tabernacles here, one for Jesus, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. The voice that spoke at that time was meant for Peter and for the other disciples. But on this occasion of the baptism of Jesus, the voice is meant for Jesus. The, me the voice is meant to clarify and confirm that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. This is God the Father affirming the Son. God the Father declaring how pleased he is with the Son's actions and what the Son is about to do and to start. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This is a high moment. This is a spiritually charged moment. 
This is a great moment that calls for shouting and foot stamping. This is a great moment that calls for hallelujahs and praise the Lord. This is indeed a great moment in the life of Jesus. Having been baptized, the Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove, and God the Father makes it clear that he's pleased with the son. And then Mark tells us immediately. Mark uses this word immediately very often in his gospel. And what Mark is telling us when he uses the word immediately, he's showing how quickly we can move from a moment of glory to a moment of trial. The unexpected appearance of trial. Out of celebration comes mourning. Out of great jubilation comes hardship. Out of a great spiritual experience comes valley experiences. Just as quickly as you're on the mountain top, the next step can take you into the valley. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And so even Jesus experienced unexpected trials. Just after having a great mountain top, the next step was a valley. And as I said, we have seen how Mark has used this immediately so often. And Mark uses it to contrast a great spiritual experience and the valley of darkness and dread. And how it doesn't take much time for us to move from one to the other. Jesus is on the mountain teaching Crowds gather around him, and immediately he gets in the boat, and a great storm erupts. Jesus and his disciples are on the lake in a boat, and immediately while Jesus is sleeping on a pillow, and immediately a great windstorm erupts. How silence! can immediately turn into noise. Jesus experienced unexpected trials. We too will experience the unexpected. We too can move from a place of celebration to a place of mourning and gnashing of teeth. And we see this also in the book of Job. Job's children are celebrating, they're having a festival. And just as quickly as they were celebrating, something happens that brings disaster in Job's life and in their life. And one after another, a servant returns to Job to say, your animals have been killed, your sons have been wiped out, your daughters have been decimated, your fields have been laid bare. And Job moved from a place of great prompt to sitting in ashes, asking God, why didn't you curse the day that I was born? The unexpected. And as human beings, we cannot avoid the unexpected. Ready or not, the unexpected will come. Ready or not, things will happen in a twinkling of an eye. I hear the word of God saying, as surely as the Lord lives, there is only a step between me and death. As surely as the Lord lives, there is only a step between jubilation and mourning. As surely as the Lord lives, there is only a step between light 
and darkness. Jesus experienced the unexpected. We too will experience the unexpected in our lives. As a matter of fact, maybe this morning, some of you know exactly what I mean. That you have been through the unexpected, where things changed very suddenly. You could not have predicted it. You could not have anticipated it. And you feel alone. I have good news for you that there is a savior in heaven who knows, who understands, because he too has been through the unexpected immediately. The second thing that Mark tells us is that the wilderness represents the gloomy phases of life. I suggest that we can see this through the place it was that the Spirit led him. And we're told that the Spirit led him where? Into the wilderness. Into a place of danger. Into a barren place. Into a place with much darkness. Into a place with grave danger. A place of desolation. A place that is gloomy a place that is of hardship, a place of suffering. When someone was possessed by demons in Mark's gospel, we are often told that the demons drove this poor victim out into the wilderness. And this is where the Spirit led Jesus, into the wilderness, into a place of of gloominess and darkness and dryness and emptiness and hardship. And again, I'm saying to us that life brings us those seasons in our lives. Life brings us seasons of hardship. Life brings us seasons of gloominess. Life brings us seasons of difficulties and pain. And once we live on this, the face of this earth, we will go through seasons that are hard and difficult. But I want you to notice, I want you to notice something, that it was the Spirit that drove him into the wilderness. What it says to me, therefore, is that when we go through the wilderness seasons of our lives, the devil is going to make us believe that we are alone. The devil is going to make us to believe that it is a God-forsaken place where the Spirit of God doesn't dwell, where nothing good can come. But I'm submitting to us that even though the wilderness seasons of our lives are hard and difficult and painful, that God is present in the wilderness, that God is working in the wilderness, that God is doing a new thing in the wilderness. Even in the wilderness, the Spirit of God is at work shaping. Because I hear the songwriter saying that the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. And so the same God that led Jesus up the mountain with three of his disciples where Jesus was transfigured before them and there was light and beauty and there was the glory of God in the wilderness. The same God who showed his glory in the mountain is the same God who is with us in the wilderness. And so again, I'm speaking to you today, and maybe you feel that you're going through the wilderness season of your life, and you feel completely abandoned by God. And you have asked, why God? Why me? Why do I have to go through this season? Where are you, God? Where are you? I can't feel you. I can't sense your presence. And then we hear his name shall be called Emmanuel, who is God with us. It was the spirit that drove him into the wilderness. 
And sometimes when we go through the wilderness seasons of our lives, it doesn't say that we are God forsaken. But the Spirit of God goes with us. Maybe I'm speaking to someone today. In the last year, the last two years, or the last three years of your life, seem as though the pieces have just been falling apart. From bad to worse, situation after situation, every time you recover from one illness, you're diagnosed with another. Every time you finish paying one bill, you are faced with another bill. Every time you fix the roof, the windows begin to fall apart. Maybe you've been there, and you're wondering, how much more can I take? How much more of this can I do? And God would have me say to you, it has not been in vain. Can I talk to someone this morning? God would have me say to you, it has not been in vain. Because you see, my child, I led you there. Because you see, my child, eventually you'd understand why I led you all this way. Because you see, my child, I led you because I know the way. You see, my child, I've led generations before you. And you see, my child, the wilderness is not your destination. It is only a path. You see, my child, the valley of the shadow of death is not where you will live forever. It is simply the path to righteousness. Here, my child, while you have been on this path, the wilderness path, the gloomy path, the hard path, you have never been forsaken. I've heard every cry. I've seen every tear drop. I've heard the secret dwellings of your own heart. I've been with you and believe you me. You are going to see it after all, what I've been doing all of this time. It is for your welfare and for your benefit. So Jesus wants you to know that he's with you in your wilderness. But let's run along quickly because Mark, as I said, it's a small, it's a very brief account of the, of the trial and the temptations of Jesus, but it is so full because Mark also tells us that Jesus journeyed through the wilderness for 40 days. These 40 days are not a random number. Israel was in the wilderness after crossing the Red Sea for what? For 40 years. Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights when he received the law of the Lord. Elijah was led for what? 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. Think also of the 40 days and 40 nights of rain that brought about the flood in Noah's day. Think of the 40 days that the spies of Israel Israel spent exploring the land. And we are, or have already mentioned the 40 days and the 40 nights, the years the people of Israel spent wandering in the wilderness so that a whole disobedient generation would die out and their children could enter the land of promise in their place. And remember how the prophet Jonah announced to the people of the ancient city of Nineveh that they only had 40 days before the city would be destroyed. Do you know what those various 40 stories have in common? The number 40 identifies a significant experience of dramatic change of some kind. The replacement of the pre-flood world with the post-flood world. A new law from God for a new nation a new land to be occupied, the replacement of one generation with another, a call to repentance that led to remarkable revival. We can similarly understand Jesus' 40 days of trial in the wilderness as meant to show that he underwent a major life-changing experience that will mark his life forever. 
that 40 day that Jesus spent in the wilderness, something significantly happened. So much so that the Jesus who went into the wilderness is not the Jesus that came out of the wilderness. The Jesus that went into the wilderness was a carpenter. The Jesus that came out of the wilderness was a preacher, was a healer, was a prophet, was a messiah, was a savior. Something happened during that 40 day journey in the wilderness. The Jesus who went into the wilderness is a Jesus who was still questioning his purpose and how he was going to fulfill the purposes of God. But the Jesus who came out of the wilderness is a Jesus who went into the temple to the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and read from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to liberate the captive, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to set the captive free. The Jesus who came out of the wilderness is a transformed Jesus in comparison to the Jesus that went into the wilderness. And that is what the 40 days represent. Change. Am I talking to someone now? Because I'm saying that whatever you are going through, if God is going through with you, God is up to something. If you are going through difficulties and hurt and challenges, if you're going through and you've been going through for a very long time, I say to you, don't turn back. I say to you, don't stop. Just keep going on because a change is coming. A change is happening in your own life, in your world, in your family in your church a change is happening go through with Jesus the tendency is for us to stop turn back Jesus wants you to keep pushing on because he's doing something during this season you know when something is planted you don't see what's happening until it shoots up. Remember, as a child, always love to plant seeds. Pea, corn, watermelon, anything. But I never allowed them to grow because I was too inquisitive. And so I planted the seeds today and went tomorrow and dug them up because it was taking too long. I needed to see what was happening. And very often I ruined what was happening because I dug it up too soon. If only I waited until something shooted out of the earth, I would have had an abundant harvest. So too with life, my brothers and sisters. Again, I'm speaking to someone today because you have been going through and you have been asking, what's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of me going through this for so long? For years, I've been going through and nothing seems to be happening. God would have me say to you, a change is coming. It is also a word for the church. Because the church of our Lord Jesus Christ have suffered much challenges in this world and during this season of, of COVID and all the economic challenges and the crime and the violence and all kinds of situations that are happening in our world. And we have seen how it has affected the church. But again, I say keep pressing on, keep pushing on, because I sense in my spirit that a mighty revival is coming that God is going to raise up the church. God is going to reposition the church. And God is counting on the church to facilitate the healing of the nation, the transformation of the nation, and the realignment of the nations of the world. Keep pushing on. Jesus, we are told, faced, he was tempted by Satan. And there's some people who would say to me, Satan is superstitious. But again and again in the Bible, we are confronted with Satan not simply as an idea, not simply as a thought, not just the personification of evil, 
but we are confronted with Satan as a person, as real. And I'm submitting to you again, my brothers and sisters, that just as Jesus was tempted by Satan, I want you to know that Satan's plan is to destroy your life. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, the devil has requested to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Brothers and sisters, I want you to hear me and hear me well. The devil plans to destroy your life, to decimate your life, to destroy your family, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your career, to destroy your friendship, to destroy your community, to destroy your church. The devil plans, if you ever talk about God or have a God in your life, in your work, in your home, the devil plans that if you have a relationship with God that he is going to do everything possible to destroy you and to render you completely helpless. And that was the plan for Jesus. And so Jesus was tempted by the devil. The devil even said to him, look, look at all of this that I have. If only you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. Brothers and sisters, don't ever lower your standards for anything. What God has planned for you, no man can take it from you. I, I, I love the way the Jamaicans put it. What is for you can be on for you. If God has planned and purposed it for you. No devil in hell can take it from you. No devil in hell can do better what, than what God is able to do. The God that we serve is the God of all power and grace and truth. He owns the world. He created the world. He can do that which can be done. And so if God can do it, it can be done. And so the devil can promise you anything that God can do. As a matter of fact, the devil promises but never fulfills. Because the devil means to destroy your life. I'm going to close by saying to you that Jesus, according to Mark, after Jesus was tempted and during his temptation, the angels waited on him. There's so much more in this passage, but... I want you to come back for the rest. <laughs> amen, amen. The angels waited on him. Hear me and hear me well. Even Jesus needed community and help. I know somebody's going to challenge me on that one because Jesus is God. Doesn't need anybody. But Jesus was also human. And by Mark telling us that the angels waited on him, Mark was saying to us that Jesus got help. Jesus made it through the wilderness because he got help. Jesus was able to overcome Satan and sin because Jesus had help. The angels waited on him. The angels supported him. The angels encouraged him. The angels fed him. The angels kept company with him. The angels spoke into his life. The angels reminded him of his purpose. The angels reminded him of who he was. The angels were simply there for the ministry of presence. The angels supported him in his hour of need. The angels enabled him and facilitated him being able to overcome. I'm making a point here because I'm saying, therefore, that we need each other. It doesn't matter how spiritually strong you are. It doesn't matter how many hours you spend in prayer every day. It doesn't matter that you know the entire Bible word for word. 
It doesn't matter that you can pray the best in the world. It doesn't matter that you're a friend of God and that you are close to God and that God shares secrets with his friends. It doesn't matter that you are here every Sunday and you give your heart to the Lord and you worship God. I'm still saying to you that if you're going to make it through this life and if you're going to make it through your dark moments and if you're going to make it through the trials and temptations that are sure to come, that if you're going to make it when life gets going and the going gets tough, that you need companionship, you need someone to journey with you, you need an accountability partner, you need someone who you know is going to be praying for you, you need someone who's going to, that you can lean upon them, you need someone who's going to pick you up when you fall, you need someone who's going to continuously speak into your life and remind you of who you are in God and what God has planned and purpose for your life. You need someone every now and again who's going to rebuke the devil. Not just the devil that is Satan, but the devils that you meet from day to day in the workplace. You need someone who's going to rebuke the devils that you meet even in church. You're going to need someone who's going to rebuke the devils who drive on the roadways. You're going to need someone who got to continually bring you back to reality, bring you back to a realization of who you are in God and what you can become in God and what God has planned and purpose for your life. You need someone who will continually speak into your life. You need someone. We need each other. We are accountable to each other and for each other. We are accountable to seek each other out. And this is exactly what this Come Back to James Street is about. We wanted to journey with all of you. We want to ensure that you do not have to journey alone. That when a loved one dies in your family, that you do not have to mourn alone, but that we can all come alongside you and mourn with you. We want to ensure that when you experience difficulties and sickness, that when you get a diagnosis from the doctor that says this is serious, that you have someone that you can lean upon, someone who can pray with you and for you, that when you have your children going astray, that you don't have to try to bring them back into the fall all by yourself. We want to come alongside you and we want to say to you together, we got this, we can do this together. We need each other and I want you to my brothers and sisters to be a part of a community of people who care. Now the truth is that sometimes you're going to meet people in the community who don't care but you are also going to meet people who care. You know I've always say there are more people who care in the church than those who don't care. I've always said that there is more grace in the church than there is sin. Because some of you would say, oh, these sinners, there's always more grace in the church than sin. We cannot out -sin God's grace. His grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. And if we journey together, think of what we can make of this nation. Think of how if we journey together and we make a commitment to journey with other people, how we can make this nation a better nation. How you can seek out those people in your workplace who need someone to come alongside them, who need someone to just listen to them and pray with them and pray for them. Think of what that can do for the transformation of the space that you work in. Think of what that would mean for our schools. Think of what that would mean for the marketplace. Think of what that would mean for the hospitals. Think of what that would mean for the health centers. Think of what that would mean for the whole nation. My brothers and sisters, we can make this place a better place. We can do this if we recognize the concept of Ubuntu. I am because we are. We are, therefore I am. There is no I without us. 
There is no us without each one of you. And so on this first Sunday of Lent, we face our struggles together. We face our trials together. We face the temptations that are sure to come together. We take each other's hand and we commit that none shall be left behind. That all of us are connected and we are only as strong as our weakest link. And so I called you to a place of being ready to take somebody's hand or allow someone to take your hand.